So we are going to raise questions, um, as we have did, we've done with the president, and also afterwards, you will have the chance to ask questions to any of these people on any matters, if possible, something they know about it. So, um, <laughs> if not, they can refuse the question, of course, like say, joker, <laughs> as we say in French. <laughs> so, um, you want to start with uh, Suzanne? Yeah, why not? <laughs> yeah, we, we, this is a follow-up of a question to the president. Uh, he actually he, he, he talked to you about it. Uh, you are the general secretary of the uh, Fédération Internationale de Sport Aéronautique. And uh, do you expect the, these sports to be uh, once in the Olympic program, or some of them, like the drones, which we have seen in, in Pyeongchang, uh, at the opening ceremonies and closing ceremonies? Do you expect your sport, or one of your sports, one of your disciplines, to join the Olympic program? Well, maybe it's less a question about expectation, but about uh, the hope. Um, the FAI was, and we are very proud of it, uh, founded in 1905 on recommendation of the Olympic Congress. And at that time, the only two air sports that we had were actually ballooning and uh, fixed wing aviation, and then everything else came. And we have since then accompanied all the aeronautical developments. So we are now also governing as a sport aero modeling, and that's including drones. Uh, we are governing paragliding, powered paragliding, which is called paramotoring, skydiving, indoor skydiving, outdoor skydiving, everything that flies. So the sky is our stadium. And talking about becoming Olympic, I can also talk on behalf of my colleagues in other federations. There are just very many ways uh, to become Olympic. So if you talk to people at the Olympic Council of Asia, they will tell you participation in the Asian Games is your path into the Olympic Games. Um, good, we are already in the Asian Beach Games and we will be in the Asian Games, but we will have to see if that works. Observing the Youth Olympic Games, we have seen some sports presented there which are now part of the Olympic program, so that seems to be a path as well. We are a member of the International World Games Association, we are participating in the World Games, there is an agreement with the IOC that disciplines in the World Games are eligible to be part of the Olympic program. So that's another path. There is the local organizing committee which is choosing disciplines. That could be a path. So there are many ways and it's then the question where to focus on. So for us, with all our disciplines that we have, we would like to make it sexy enough that it will be chosen one day, obviously. Um, we will work and focus on performing well and being present. We have um, our Olympiad of Air Games, uh, Air Sports, uh, every few years with the FAI World Air Games, but uh, we are not proactively investing into promoting a sport to become Olympic because we think it just needs to have the strength as a sport practiced globally with enough visibility, with integrity of the rules, that it's then one day eligible. Thank you for, for the answer. Maybe a last question before to, to give the floor. Uh, what will be the main challenges for you to become an Olympic Federation? If you could precise maybe this point, because there is money for sure, but maybe there is other challenges. Could you precise and uh, is it really a key challenge for you? Well, we, we are not an Olympic Federation, but we are recognized by the International Olympic Committee and we are part of the Olympic family. So we are already complying with the, with the um, constitution of the, of the Olympic movement. We, are, we have an anti-doping program. Uh, we have transparency on, on all our activities. We have taken part in the governance study from the Global Association of International Sports Federation. We have ranked quite well among all these international federations, so I think the, the preconditions are already quite good. But the challenge will be if we were chosen, from what I know from colleagues who have been chosen, like sports climbing, it will be a long and uh, very uh, strenuous uh, path with a lot of work and uh, then being rewarded with being part of the Olympic Games. Okay, thank you. Well, next to you, we have a little time, but uh, time is short, as you know, and we will have ask a question to the Director General of ITA now. Uh, and maybe you, you come back later with questions from the audience, so please prepare your questions if you are interested in aeronautic sports. 
and joining the Olympic program, but the Director General of the ITA, International Testing Agency, Mr. Ben Cohen, Benjamin Cohen. Uh, this is a new agency which was created in 2017, and uh, there are many experts of doping in the room, uh, Professor Soji, for example, uh, but uh, personally at least, I, I don't understand exactly the, the position of IT8 compared to WADA, compared to NADOs, the national anti-doping organizations, and all these stakeholders of anti-doping. Could you, could you uh, tell us a little bit more? Okay. Uh, yes, the anti-doping world is not that easy. Uh, well, so if very schematic, WADA, the World Anti-Doping Agency, is the global regulator. It's founded by the governments of the world and the Olympic movement and financed equally by each, uh, so th the whole governments of the world through a United Nations Convention come together and decide to finance and create WADA. And same on the Olympic movement that said, we will match whatever the governments give uh, to create WADA, we will match with the same funding, 50%. So WADA is the global regulator. Uh, it sets the rules, it enacts the World Anti-Doping Code, it defines the standards, how do you test an athlete, how a laboratory needs to be accredited to be able to conduct anti-doping analysis, etc., etc. So it's really a regulator. Now, according to the code, uh, some people have to do anti-doping. They have to manage, they have to educate, they have to do testing, etc., etc. So the system as it is today is that the governments of the world establish, each government needs to establish a national anti-doping agency. Mm -hmm. In Switzerland, it's Anti-Doping Suisse, Anti-Doping Switzerland. In France, it's the AFLD, Agence Française de Lutte contre le Dopage, etc., etc. So you have a number of uh, national anti-doping agencies. And on the Olympic side, on the sports side, each international federation must have an anti-doping program. And hence, therefore, your question, which I think is messy, is that you have hundreds of different anti-doping organizations, each doing their own anti-doping program. Now, where the ITA fits in that? Uh, the President Bar said that one of the key uh, steps to establishing the ITA was credibility. We were pretty, I think we as a, as a sports community were pretty badly hit with the Russian scandal. I think this was a catalyst to say, that's it. There are too many potential conflict of interests in doping, it's very sensitive. It's potentially not the core business of international federations to do doping. They need to grow the sports, develop the sports. Uh, on the side of the government, there may be conflict of interest, uh, like it happened in Russia, where the, the Russian government was promoting, <coughs> promoting through doping substances their own athletes to gain medals. So the Olympic movement came together and said, let's change that. There are way too many conflict of interests. Let's create an independent testing authority that will take over all the anti-doping, the management of anti-doping on behalf of all those organizations. And so very, very quickly, the, the government said, no, 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 we want to continue with our own national agencies. We don't need an independent testing authority. On the sports side, the IOC took the lead and said, no, sport will make that independent. So let's create an independent testing authority that can manage independently anti-doping program for the sports community <laughs> and the Olympic Games and the major events. So yeah, that's where the ITS is. As you know, as you know uh, it's not independent anymore. It's international and it's not an authority. It's an agency. Correct. And it still does testing. Yeah. But in French, it says control. We agence de contrôle. Yes. <laughs> so what are you doing exactly? <laughs> testing or control? Yeah, well, I inherited when I was appointed, the name was already there, and I complained. I was the first one to say, what, what is ITA testing? I mean, it's not really, it doesn't really cover what we're doing. What we're doing is that we manage anti-doping programs independently. Uh, and an anti-doping program is a lot broader than just testing. Testing is just a little part of an anti-doping program. An anti-doping program is having regulations. Mm -hmm. It's educating people, in particular athletes, to make them understand the regulations. It's defining risk assessments, is doing therapeutic use exemptions. I will not go into the technicalities, but there is, uh, let's say, almost are you doing this work for FIA, for example? We are not doing Not this. yet? Uh, oh, yeah, well, we maybe yeah, you we should. We are, actually, sorry. Yeah, we are. <laughs> okay, there are yeah, many questions, sorry. of course, and I'm sure there will be more. But uh, let's move now to uh, Martin Muller, a new colleague from... Uh, the Faculty of uh, Social Science and Social and Political Science 
in the Institute of Geography. Faculty of, of, Ge of Geosciences, Geosciences and the Environment. Yeah, sorry, but same building. I'm <laughs> totally uh, wrong. Uh, but in the Institute of Geography and Development and an expert on um, the mega events and uh, urban developments. And uh, we have, of course, prepared questions for you. Um, as we heard, the president talked about organizing uh, events in existing facilities, which is a very good idea, of course. Uh, you avoid the investments and so on. But uh, does it mean that the mega events, like the Olympic Games, will always be in the same places where there are existing facilities, for example, Olympic Park, and will always come back to these Olympic Parks, for example? What do you think? Well, thank you for the question. Perhaps, first of all, um, to everybody who has trouble, like I had, deciphering the different acronyms of the organizations we belong to. I had to Google each one of them, except for my own. Um, IGD means Institut de Géographie et Durabilité. Um, and, and it's quite easy to get mixed up in, in French with the acronyms, so um, I constantly get it mixed up myself. So the question you could legitimately be asking yourselves is, what does a geographer that I am have to do with the Olympic Games, a big sports event. And the answer to this is that increasingly these events have become urban events. And that's very evident if you look at the money that, that is spent on the sports part of events, like the Olympic Games, and on the urban events part. And by urban part, I mean everything that is built from um, transport lines to um, new hotels to Olympic Village and so on. And usually these days, the cost for the urban part, for infrastructure and other things, is about three to four times the cost for organizing the sports events and everything that has to do with it. So the question is legitimate. Um, wh what is the IOC doing when they're talking about sustainability in Agenda 2020? In particular, as Thomas Bach said, uh, wanting to reuse as a first, um, in, a, in the first instance, existing facilities. Um, and I, I think reusing existing facilities is, is an excellent idea. Um, I think that um, the IOC could even go further, actually. Um, um, because at the moment, the IOC, I think one sees clearly that the IOC was funded, founded at the end of the 19th century in, um, at the beginning of what we know now, now know as modernity. It's a modern enterprise. And what is modernity about? It's about mass production. Um, for masses of people. So we have um, a mass gathering, the Olympic Games, um, with big corporate sponsors like Coca-Cola and McDonald's. Um, and you have many people at the same time with the mass media um, broadcasting everything else. Um, and so one of the ideas, ideas would actually be um, to say, not only use existing facilities, but also decentralize Olympic Games even more than that is the case at the moment. Um, that would be particularly interesting also for countries such as Switzerland, um, where um, I teach my students in my urban geography class that um, Switzerland is not only a country, it is also a city. Um, because if you compare it with the greater Los Angeles area, Switzerland is about as large as Los Angeles. So why could, can Los Angeles have the 2028 games, but Switzerland cannot have the 2020, 30 winter games, say? as a country that is a city at the same time, with multiple urban cores such as Lausanne, such as Bern, such as Zurich, such as uh, Sion, and so on. Um, so that would be my answer to the question. No, the, the Olympic Games are not going to be, go back to um, the same locations, but the Olympic Games need to rethink actually what they mean by when they talk about existing infrastructure and where that infrastructure is. And they also need to, as an, as an urban geographer, um, we increasingly don't talk about cities, but we talk about city regions or mega city regions. And so for us, we live in the urban age where cities have expanded massively. Um, we have, in Switzerland, we have massive re-urbanization. And so if it's cities who host the Olympic Games, then I think the IOC also needs to rethink what they mean when they say a city. Thank you. Another question? Um, will be more maybe for the president of the IOC, but I will, I will say that to you will try to answer. Uh, how to evaluate the, the impact of the heritage discourse on Olympic bids and organization? I think it's a, a big word at the moment, legacy and so on. So what is your opinion on legacy on, of the Olympic Games on urban, on urban development? So I think legacy is one of the big buzzwords, certainly, in, um, in the Olympic Games at the moment. Um, and legacy basically meaning everything that is left after the Olympic Games have left town. 
So thinking increasingly not only about um, the event itself, the couple of weeks that the event lasts, but the years and decades that come afterwards. And, and I'm quite divided about this, uh, this idea of legacy, I have to say. What I like, of course, is the idea that the preparation for the Olympic Games should not only be for the period of a couple of weeks that the Olympic Games are on. Because for the people who live in a certain city, um, it's not about that. Um, it's about long-term benefits that they want to have from the Olympic Games. And it's not about be, uh, throwing a big party um, and then having uh, all the trash to, to tidy up afterwards. Um, but I'm also a bit wary about the term legacy, um, partly because it's so much focused on material aspects of legacy. In particular, many host cities of Olympic Games tend to think legacy as something they've built and that they can point to when visitors come five or ten years after and they say, oh, this is one of the legacies of the Olympic Games, which incentivizes host cities to, to build even more than they would have otherwise in order to be able to show legacy. And, and perhaps there is a certain <coughs> tendency of that even here in Lausanne, some self-criticism, because usually when you talk legacy, we point next door to the vortex and vortex. say, this is, this is our legacy there. Um, and, a, and let's see how, how that legacy turns I think. out. Sorry? It will be a great legacy for the students. Let, let's see. You know, I'm, uh, um, as, as an ur urban geographer, urbanist, um, I have some doubts about the, the architecture and the whole thing, how the whole thing is, um, has been developed. Um, but we're not talking about the vortex anyway. Um, okay. So I do hope it's, it's going to be a great legacy. Yes. <laughs> well, you're, speak you're speaking with a vice chancellor in front of you, so you have to be careful. That, no, <laughs> quite, quite the opposite. No, I think the students were waiting this for a long time. Last, last night I was at the Swiss Tech, EPFL, sorry. <laughs> but uh, it was uh, so lively with all the students around, uh, the coffees and the caf cafes and so on. Very, very nice. And I hope we will have the same. I'm thing. definitely hoping the best. Yeah. And yeah. It's, it's impressive. Now we have to move to yeah. Despina Mavonati, who is a lawyer. We used to work at CAS, Court of Arbitration for Sport. There was no discussion about CAS, but the president of the IOC at one point said CAS uh, should, uh, should uh, reform itself. <laughs> Didn't say how, but uh, this is not the question. The, the question really uh, I would like to raise is about uh, what's happening nowadays with uh, hyperandrogenism. It's very difficult <laughs> to, to say. I, I'm sure you know what we are talking about. That is the fact that uh, some uh, women have high levels of natural testosterone in their body, and which apparently helps them win medals in uh, competitions. And uh, the famous case of uh, Semania Castor, uh, who was recently uh, ordered by uh, Athletics Federation to uh, I'm explaining this because maybe not everybody is aware, but uh, forced, kind of forced, in order to compete to to take drugs to lower uh, testosterone levels. It's a bit technical, but of course she refused, and she went to the federal tribunal, which is the highest court in Switzerland. We have people from outside Switzerland. So, uh, and uh, yesterday, I think it was yesterday or the day before, the Swiss federal tribunal said, no, this is not right. We suspend this rule of IAAF, the Athletics Federation, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll see, we'll judge, we'll take a little time probably, uh, and eventually the, the CAS decision uh, will be uh, suspended or cancelled. I don't know exactly what they use as a word. What do you think of all this? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. Uh, Interesting question. So I have a couple of disclaimers as a good lawyer. You have, first of all, it's a pending case. Uh, and uh, most importantly, we only have at our disposal uh, a press release issued by the CAS and a six-page uh, executive summary um, of uh, 160 uh, pages uh, award. Uh, I wouldn't uh, be able to comment, and even if I, I would give my personal opinion, it would take more time to mitigate, explaining why this opinion should be mitigated than anything else. Um, the other thing is that I also sit uh, um, on the IAAF Disciplinary Tribunal uh, as an arbitrator, so I wouldn't feel comfortable expressing any personal opinions. Uh, that being said, uh, uh, even, even though I've only dealt with doping-related cases, Nobody is listening. What's that? 
Okay, uh, that being said, I think it's more interesting if we raise some questions, uh, answer to the question, or you know, by raising questions that can instigate a more interesting and constructive debate, as opposed to just uh, uh, giving an opinion. We have uh, heard in the media, we have seen in the media many uninformed individuals uh, expressing their opinions, many informed individuals expressing even uh, stronger opinions on that issue. And I would place myself somewhere in the middle and I would refrain from taking a strong stance. However, um, I would say, w what do we deal with in this case? So the CAS decision was an arbitral award. And that's the st starting point, right? So what's the difference between arbitration and state court proceedings? And by reading the press release, I tried to decipher some of the elements that will be made available later on. And one of those was that the panel was very limited in its uh, mission uh, to deal with specific questions. Uh, and I ask myself, is this a real case to be addressed and to be brought before an arbitral institution such as the CAS? That's the first question. And the other question would be, what exactly are we looking for when we regulate these questions? Mm -hmm. Level playing field? The president, Thomas Bach, talked about the Olympic values. And one of those is uh, uh, undeniably the level playing field and the equal competition, fair competition. Then he said he talked about achieving goals to combat uh, match fixing and doping and in order to protect clean athletes, athletes who are not cheats. Well, do these athletes with these conditions fall within this framework? I'm not so sure they do. Another question that we could raise in this regard is, apart from, you know, several uh, international federations are hiding behind the fact that they're private associations, and as such, they have the liberty of regulating these issues uh, without uh, taking account of the various issues such as human rights. Um, I would say that beyond all this, and apart from anything else, the question is simple. It goes down to the values, the core values of the Olympism, because that's the uh, supervising uh, movement, the Olympic movement that's supervising, uh, supervising all the federations uh, underneath the Olympic movement. And what, what are these values? Are they uh, equal competition and discrimination? The president, again, mentioned several times that discrimination is a major value, probably the biggest one. So what would be, um, would be necessary to do in order to achieve that value, which is a core value? So you, you see this issue as a value fight between different values and uh, at the end, more political question than a question to be arbitrated by a CAS. Or fortunately a fortunately or unfortunately, uh, uh, every major decision of that kind uh, goes down to political considerations. Mm -hmm. And by political, I don't mean the political in the strict sense of the term, but the major repercussions that such a decision could have uh, in the image of, to the image of the federation in question, for example. And uh, all this is interesting. Then you mentioned the hyperandrogenism regulations, and I would like to comment on that uh, for a second. Uh, so the duty chant case that came a couple of years ago was about the hyperandrogenism regulations, which ever since have been abolished. And the IAAF came uh, back with another set of regulations for the DS DSD. Um, regulations and they target specifically individuals who have this condition called 46XY DSD, which is a category under which castor semenia falls. And when she went to the CAS and she requested the invalidity to, that the um, IAAF regulations be declared invalid, the CAS panel by majority says, said, first of all, it said the regulations are discriminatory. There is no question about that. But this, on its own, does not mean that they should be declared invalid. It then proceeded to a test, seeing, trying to establish whether the regulations were necessary, were proportionate, and were reasonable. And it found by majority that this was the case. I was intrigued, personally, and I could change my opinion if I read the entire CAS award again, by the fact that from the executive summary, what I saw was, in the end of the executive summary, the panel 
raised serious concerns as to the implementation of these regulations. Because what happens is that all these individuals who, whose testosterone is above that limit have to keep their testosterone low at all times in order to be eligible to compete, and even six months prior to the competition in question. Now, the question I raise is, how would this be possible? You need constant medical supervision in order to be able to do so. And the panel raised the same concerns, saying, well, in terms of uh, um, applicability and implementation, there might, we might change our opinion with respect to the proportionality. In my opinion, these tests should be an inherent test when you value and you judge the proportionality of the regulations, because implementation should be an element inherent to the, the regulations and not something apart. Mm -hmm. So I understand it's a very complicated question, and we will talk about it again, I'm sure, and the lawyers will love it, of course, yes. a lot of discussions. <laughs> now we, we will continue because time is short. Thank you. Uh, Professor Canepele. Uh, Professor Canepele is uh, one of the main specialists of corruption in sport, and he's in, in, the, facult in, the, in the Institute of uh, Criminal Sciences. So maybe um, you heard the answer of... Uh, President Thomas Barr about uh, how to fight uh, against corruption. So what is your personal vision, maybe, because you made some study about that, and uh, maybe if you could answer to the question how to avoid or fight effectively corruption, uh, notably in link with mega sport event attribution, maybe. Okay, thank you. So, uh, it's difficult to answer, but let me say, we start two years ago with the Council of Europe to collect, uh, it, uh, to build a database on cases of corruption that were, were published in open sources. And we were able to highlight some patterns linked to mega events. For example, at the moment, I say that the amount of risk of corruption in mega events is low because there's no candidate for the Olympic Games, so there's no competition, so you don't need to corrupt anyone to get the Olympic Games at the moment, first of all. So uh, there are some environmental uh, aspects that, that uh, can affect the amount of corruption risk uh, according to mega events. We see there are some patterns linked to the fact that when they have to decide to award uh, the, uh, the event, you have corruption risk. And then the pattern is associated with the uh, construction of the mega structure. So even in this second case, the Olympic Committee decided for the durability, so to limit the number of mega uh, infrastructure. So even in this case, the new way in which uh, the uh, Olympic Committee decides to approach the question of durability just reduce the uh, risk of corruption because there's less money to invest in building new infrastructure. And then uh, there is another moment when we have other, uh, let's say, corruption risk linked to the uh, um, uh, organization of the events. We have some ticketing scandals that uh, happen uh, even at, uh, at Rio, and it is interesting, it's the same prosecutor who did the investigation for the Olympic Games, he did the same for uh, the uh, world champion that uh, was uh, holding in Brazil two years before. And uh, we are other other uh, corruption behavior that uh, may have, uh, could, could, be linked, could be linked with sponsoring. So we had cases of uh, some uh, uh, re responsible of the committee of uh, the athletes for Kenya was arrested because he just kept the uh, equipment that was uh, supposed to be delivered to the athletes and just keep it for, for himself to, revend, uh, to resell it. And uh, other cases linked, for example, to, um, to the, um, the anti-doping control. So there was someone, there was some a trainer that was offering himself to do the test uh, uh, in, instead of the athletes, so just providing some insight about when the uh, uh, anti-doping uh, examinators were coming to doing the to doing the test to do the, the test. So we are different types of uh, corrupting behavior that are associated to different moment of the mega mega events. And uh, what is important is that uh, we can. I mean, there are environmental contexts that now is much more favorable in the sense that there's less opportunity to corrupt, uh, but. Uh, the more, and we see the more that the, the Federation, International Federation, IOC are uh, building codes and uh, try to set up some rules which are more clear, the less there will be opportunity for corruption. Don't, as transparency and accountability are one of the key 
uh, to reduce the amount of corruption and risk of corruption in, uh, in sport, as it happens for every kind of context, every kind of uh, business uh, uh, sector, business field. Thank you. So, so you seem to be quite optimistic, uh, I think, to, to fight against corruption in the Olympic movement. So maybe, could you maybe explain uh, what uh, uh, can criminal sciences uh, bring to the regulation of international sport? Because maybe uh, in the audience it's not so clear, and for us it's not so clear. What yeah. is exactly We have two main components. Mm -hmm. uh, let's say we can call criminal science or someone in the UK that are just launched its new brand, Crime Sciences, in the sense that the uh, study of crime uh, uh, can be uh, mm, done through different uh, disciplines, different sciences. We have forensic science, and the core of forensic science is traces. So traces can be used to reconstruct, to identify, and to uh, understand what's going, what's, what happened. And uh, uh, this is uh, the, the way that we can do, for example, uh, uh, the anti-doping test and uh, use other uh, forensic techniques to recover information, even for uh, digital traces. Now it's quite important uh, field that is going to be developed. And there is another component linked to the uh, intelligence. So we know that, for example, uh, the uh, deviant phenomena are not scattered in a random way, but they are clustered in time, in space. And so uh, if we are able to understand, to detect this pattern, we, are, we will be much more uh, efficient in highlight and prevent uh, different conduct, uh, so, uh, different so, uh, deviant yeah. conduct. So you would advise uh, students to go into this field? I'm in as as Desmin has said, I'm in conflict of interest because I'm part, <laughs> <laughs> so I cannot answer. Well, there are many students. But if, you, if you have questions, of course. <laughs> they can I, come to you afterwards. May yeah. I say that I sure. hired two people from the forensic department yeah, yeah, of the I University know. of Lausanne. Yeah, no, of course there are jobs, and these are new jobs in intelligence and in forensic analysis yeah. per se. And yeah. And if I may, the last thing that I, I missed to, uh, to remark was that the reform in sport, as it happened always outside, happened through scandals. So we have the big, scan mm -hmm. big scandals linked to the um, uh, IOC at the beginning of 2000, and then we had the reform, we have the FIFA scandal, then we had the reform. So the, the pace of reforms is linked to scandals. So we have to see uh, also a positive way when scandal just uh, appear. Yeah. It's also an opportunity yeah. to reform and yeah. to change the system and yeah. to reshape the system in a more uh, consistent and resilient way to yeah. uh, to fight against uh, uh, integrity of, threats. The uh, secret of strategic management is to transform a crisis into an opportunity. Yeah. It's difficult, but it's uh, the idea. Okay. Well, this was uh, quite a large uh, range of topics, but uh, I'm sure the audience has uh, also other ideas and yeah, time to raise question. I see one hand, and uh, there should be a, another one, but there is no microphone around. I don't know where the gentleman went, but uh, yeah, okay. Oh, because the microphones are there, okay. It's on this side, for sure. Yeah, we took the microphone for the panelists. Yeah, please. Hi, uh, Thomas Roos, an alumni of AISTS here at UNIL and also a professional athlete and scientist. We heard a little bit about Olympic Agenda 2020 from President Bach, but it didn't escape my attention that the name of this rendezvous is Sport Future. So I'd like to ask each of the panelists in 10 seconds or less, or maybe one word if you can distill it down even more, <laughs> what, if there was an Olympic Agenda 2028 or 2030, what would you propose to President Bach be one of the key tenets or the pillars of it? Thank you. Yeah, That's not an easy question. Keywords. Is it 10 seconds you want, or five, or one minute, or 
one hour. Okay, uh, so I would definitely say education, and education, again, in the large sense of the term, not the typical education. For example, in doping-related cases, we, we focus on educating the athletes on what constitutes an anti-doping rule violation. For example, the substances they need to avoid. What I notice and what I witnessed from my experience as an arbitrator, especially in less mainstream sports, is that athletes lack education, uh, legal education, in, uh, totally. So they, they come there especially when they are not accompanied by high-level legal counsel, they're ignorant of their basic rights. I would insist that, you know, athletes have more, are more, are better accompanied in their legal battles, are more uh, educated in all these uh, senses, and they are po more powerful. They become more powerful. So what I would say is, is two things. Um, one is if you talk about legacy and take it seriously, then get people on board as decision makers who know something about urban development. Because at the moment we have uh, the IOC, who is a sports organization, making decisions on multi-billion dollar urban development projects without any urban expertise, essentially. Um, that's first. And the second is don't, at the moment the IOC is a is an organization that's not a follower, uh, not a leader, but a follower. So it's driven by scandals or by crises, and when a crisis comes along, it moves. Um, that's one way of transforming an organization. You could also stay ahead of the crises, actually, and, and be more open and responsive to, to what is around you. Um, so the openness or the, the responsiveness to trends rather than moving through crisis. And just perhaps um, when Thomas Bach said five years ago they implemented Agenda 2020, but there was no need or no crisis, well, that was just after the Sochi Olympic Games where uh, nobody wanted to bid for the Olympic Games anymore and the upcoming Rio Games were looking disastrous. So well, there was a big crisis on the horizon and that's the only reason why the Olympic Agenda 2020 came about. Okay. So what I would say is um, for the sports program, there's nothing that cannot be discussed. So I, because it was described and it is a bit of an issue, that the idea of the IOC is that for the Olympic program, first of all, all the Olympic summer federations have the guaranteed right to be part of the program. And I would say from outside perspective, that would be interesting to say we change that. There is no guaranteed place, but there will be a different process how sports will be selected for each of the <coughs> Olympic Games. And it might be different every time. And it will be looking at global relevance, it will be looking at who is participating, what can be presented, what are trends in society, and be very open-minded and uh, that everything can be discussed. That would be something that I would like to see. Um, I, I would, and that's a theme that is dear to Professor Chaplet as well, I would, I would focus on, on good governance or better governance. Uh, I think the general opinion, and, and perhaps Sion 2026 is, is a testament to that, is that I think the general public have a rather negative vision. It's not global, but a rather negative vision of the sports institution. I think they believe that it's a bunch of old men uh, being re-elected forever and ever, and that the money is spent in uh, in lavish hotels and parties and board meetings in five-star hotels. And I, th I think there's a little bit of change that needs to happen there uh, with, with, you know, good processes, gender equality, terms limit, age limit potentially, uh, more independent people in the boards, maybe the IUC session, the, the, bo the membership of the IUC, it, it's still personal. It's people deciding where the games go. Uh, so there, there's a bunch of governance aspect that I think I would review to, to, you know, be ready so that sport is ready for the next 50 years. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, accountability for uh, international federation about how the money is spent, and the second is about again education, in the sense that uh, I take the example just a couple of days ago, uh, there was a training on uh, women uh, football players planning how to manage and to deal with someone who is trying to approach you when uh, he wants to convince you to fix a match. So what you can do when someone approaches you, what you have to do? This is the, the point. So the idea is just to provide and support through education athletes to manage with this kind of stuff because uh, it's easy to say uh, one year later then it was corrupted, it was, it was, uh, it didn't realize that it was really a, a fix and it was involved in something which was dirty, but we should support and help athletes to 
protect themselves, not only from uh, doping, but also from uh, man match manipulation. Thank you. Another question. If you can briefly present yourself. Thank you. It will be very short, yeah. Uh, Julien Babel, so I'm one of the responsible for, for food golf. It's a young sport. Question for Mr. Cohen. Um, we've got uh, uh, the status of observer from guys. And uh, of course, in, for every sport, every business, uh, the money is involved. And one of the steps to go forward, to go to the next um, step to be recognized for, for by Olympic, is to have an anti doping program. Um, we've checked that with uh, VADA. It's cost a lot of money. For example, for the World Cup, uh, we wanted to implement that, but it was costing basically one third of uh, the budget because if we wanted to do it properly, it would cost a lot of money. So the question is, as we can't do it now because the money needs to be involved uh, in development, doping is going forward. Without that, we can test it. So doping will have, from the start, a step forward, a step more than the anti-doping program. So my question is, why should we pay for anti-doping? Why, why some budget should not be um, for the young sport to, to, to test the, you know, to make the anti-doping program? Because for, for us, it's like, or we develop, or we test, so. I, I, I fully agree with you. I think that one, it's the, the, the elephant in the room whenever you speak about anti-doping is, is the money. Where do you get it from? Uh, you speak to, uh, you know, I, I, I give you an example. Uh, the, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the budget of WADA, but the World Anti-Doping Agency is, has 30 million every year. 30 million is less than uh, Lionel Messi's salary. It's less than the Cycling Sky Team's uh, annual budget. Uh, and that's the World Anti-Doping Agency. So it's heavily under-resourced. We are light years behind the cheaters. So the question that as a community, as government, we need to ask ourselves, do we want to control what's going on or do we want to eradicate doping? If we want to eradicate doping, there needs to be a serious uh, inject influx of, of money into, into the programs. Um, now, where do you find it? You know, you speak to sports ministers and they will say, listen, I'm a sport minister, I have 20 other priorities. So show me that there is a problem in doping. Uh, you speak to international federation, they will say, listen, we need to grow the sports, we need to build infrastructure, we need to this and that and this, and then you ask statistics. <laughs> we know the statistics. We do 300,000 tests every year in the world. There is 1,500 positives. So that's less than 1% of positives out of all the anti-doping tests. So every economist will say, well, <laughs> don't invest in that. That's a terrible business. It's not effective. So again, I think we need to think of ways to reduce the cost, to find ways to test athletes in, in, you know, in a maybe less intrusive manners. We're discussing with experts to do dry blood spots. So instead of really taking blood, which is very intrusive and costs a lot of money because you need to ship it, to have a little pinch in the, in the finger to get a little dry blood spot and analyze it. So we're looking at different ways, artificial intelligence, new technologies to reduce those costs. But today, there simply is nothing. And as the ITA, the money that we get to manage anti-doping programs is the money, the money that we're able to negotiate with the partners. So for example, to give you a concrete example with the IOC, I need to negotiate with the IOC the budget for the Tokyo 2020 Olympic Games. So now IOC says, no, 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 it costs too much. You need to reduce that. Uh, uh, I say, okay, well, what do you want? So I think it's valid for every organization, and Suzanne here is in the exact same situation as, uh, as Minigolf. So what I'm trying to do now is to negotiate with umbrella organizations to say as an umbrella organization, IOC or others, why don't you dedicate a sustainable pot of money that we can use to test in, in uh, mini golf or foot golf, in aeronautic or other uh, smaller sports that do not necessarily have the resources to do that. Aeronautics wants to say something. Yes, and uh, because I just want to say that I'm absolutely feeling with you, but we are IOC recognized, so we're even under a stricter anti-doping program that we have to fulfill. And uh, when WADA was doing the compliance uh, check with all the international federations, they applied a framework which was 
um, the same, no matter if you were a small federation or if you were an Olympic federation. And we, in the first feedback from the compliance check, had a very bad result. But, I mean, simply because we had the question, do you have a full-time anti-doping staff? And we had to say, well, we can't afford that, so we don't have a full anti-doping staff. So that was a minus point. And it just continued like that. And I think it was 200 questions. Our anti-doping <laughs> manager is here. And it's giving us a, a, a bad time. And it costs a lot of money. But I still would just want to focus there maybe at least simple ways to, to do something about anti-doping, which is just producing um, education material. And uh, there, there is help provided. Um, and I mean, maybe we can even provide you some inspiration on how to do that with a low cost budget, uh, because that's how we have to do it. We can't afford to spend a lot of money on that, but we have to do it. So we need to be very creative on that. But and uh, we need to educate athletes about the fact that there are people out there who are trying to sell you something where you think you can improve your performance but it's actually bad for your health. So I think there is also an obligation for an international sports federation to take care about it. But the rest of it is a nuisance. I can just confirm but that. Isn't it the idea of ITA to, to, to put together the resources for the small federations? Of course, very large ones like uh, UCI, for example, they have a own department anti-doping department, but the small ones, they could uh, work together and uh, put together the resources in order to, to spare a little bit of money. Yeah, but I mean, it still costs money and it costs time and resources. And that is because we are subject to an external framework which is enforced on us. And uh, sometimes you have to ask if that is in relation to the actual danger that might be in our sports. So that's the problem about yeah. it. You, you are saying basically that uh, depends on the sport also. Some sports are more exposed than others. You want to add something, Ben? Yeah, it's just, uh, I agree, that's the idea of the IT, is to centralize the operation so that each federation does not necessarily have to have an anti-doping manager, a medical, a scientist, a lawyer, a forensic expert, <laughs> uh, because this is what the WADA code requires you to. You need to have an investigation policy and potentially be able to receive whistleblowers' uh, information. So the idea is to have under the same roof all the necessary skills to be able to support all the international federation and then to create economies of scale. When now I negotiate with the company to send some doping control officers uh, for a test, I can send the same doping control officer and cover 20 different sports. In the same day, he's going to test in swimming, in aeronautic, in football, etc. So we can reduce the cost. Today, it's not bearing fruits yet because we're one year old. But uh, if we meet again, I'm hoping that in, in, in two, three years, we can already reduce the cost. It's never going to be free, but we, can, we, we are working on that for sure. Okay, thank you very much. A few more questions. We still have a little bit of time. Uh, is, oh, we were already with the microphone. Okay, go ahead. Thanks all for your for your speech. Um, I'm Tim. Push push the button. This should be green. Yeah, I'm Tim from French <coughs> for a sports science uh, part of uh, Nancy University. Uh, my question goes more to Mr. Muller, I think, um, with the the global warming and the lack of snow. Which future do you see for Olympics? Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Very good question, which is also at the heart of the work we do in our faculty of geosciences and the environment, climate change. Um, and it's also a question that goes to the heart of what Thomas Bach mentioned, sustainability, which um, is uh, key to Agenda 2020 and to the Olympic Games and the Olympic movement in general. Um, and I think one has to recognize two things. The first one is many winter sports are not particularly sustainable to start with. Um, and there's no, f no way of getting around this. Um, certainly when I look at the airport in Geneva and how many people fly into Geneva to go skiing in the French or Swiss Alps, then I'm not sure whether that's, uh, whether that's the types of sports that we should try to increase and, and lobby. Um, and the second question is, yes, where, if the current model of hosting winter games doesn't change, where can they still go? And that's one of the largest questions the IOC is facing, is not who is going to host the summer games, but who, is going to host, who will be able to host the winter games. Um, but there's also lots of technological innovation, in particular in snowmaking. 
which is, is of course ironic because it's the opposite of sustainability. You need to invest more, um, not only energy, but also you need to have artificial lakes and um, have all kinds of a technolo technological dispositive. Um, and of course, the, the very activities of bringing athletes and spectators to that place to watch the Winter Games is, is contributing to climate change um, and is making it even more difficult. So I, I don't have a real answer other than um, the answer that um, goes around sustainability in general, which is dematerialize. And dematerialize, which means um, don't bring as many people in the same place, um, don't, don't move too much around, um, th think about what kind of sports um, you really want to have and what it does to the environment. Theoretically, Qatar could host the 2036 <laughs> Winter Games. No, 2038. Uh, digital Olympics, if I understand well. Yeah, That's yeah, yeah. an interesting view because for 2030 agenda, we talked about nobody mentioned climate change, but obviously this might be an issue in a few years' time. Uh, a few, few, few months ago, there was an April Fool's Day uh, piece of news that uh, they announced the end of the Winter Games. This was April's fool, you know. This was very funny because I believed in it. I read the whole thing and only at the end I thought, oh yeah, this is April. Maybe, maybe it's closer day. than we think, actually. Yeah. Well, maybe it's not such a April Fool's Day. Okay. Um, yeah, another one, probably, yep. Thank you. Hello, thank you. I'm uh, Pablo Rossetti, also former ISTS uh, participant. My question for Professor Mueller, uh, you talk about legacy and uh, pro probably how IOC should invest in it for a future agenda 2028-2032. But we also have referendums in the picture and sometimes to sell to the people the, uh, the self-legacy is not that easy. And if you don't have the vortex or if you have a city like Toronto where you ask people uh, you, you won't have any new venue, sport facility. So why we should invest in, in the Winter Olympic Games? How should be the um, strategy of IOC in general terms in this legacy approach of soft legacy? So um, in my view, the best legacy is the legacy you don't see. Um, <laughs> That doesn't mean that there is no legacy, but it's a legacy that that has become such an integral part of a city that you don't notice it even anymore as a legacy. Um, take the Olympic Park in Munich, my hometown. Um, many people will know it's the Olympic Park, but the younger generation won't know that it's there because of the Olympic Games. It's just become such a normal part of the city. Um, essentially, the strategy of the, of the IOC, I think, should be, they're going in the right direction, I think. Um, to, to not um, insist on building big, shiny new things that then cost a lot of money to maintain. Um, to then also be able to say, look, the Olympic Games are actually not that expensive as you might think, because that's many of the disc much of the discourse around the Olympic Games is they're just enormously expensive and you don't get anything except for some big elite sports facilities. So they're moving in that direction. But of course, you mentioned the, the, the conflict that they have is if they have nothing to point to, then the people will ask, you know, why should we do it in the first place if, if there's nothing coming out of it? I think the other big issue for cities is, in different countries, cities stand to benefit in different ways from the Olympic Games. Because there are certain countries that give massive federal subsidies to cities hosting the Olympic Games, which causes a net inflow of money that the city wouldn't have otherwise. And so in those countries, cities have a huge incentive to apply for Olympic Games simply because it gives them leverage over the federal budget to extract money out of the federal um, budget. Um, that's the case in Germany, for example. It was the case in Russia. Um, it's to a certain degree also the case in Switzerland, um, which distorts incentives for cities because they're bidding for something just to get the money to do something and they propose something that fits with the Olympic Games rather than that fits necessarily with their urban development priorities. And that's often not the same thing. Often Olympic Games priorities and urban development priorities are different. So there is also massive distortion in the way our, the different levels of government are organized and in the way incentives are provided by the federal government. A situation that, for example, doesn't exist so much in the United States where the federal government says, look, we're not giving you a single cent 
and we're not even signing guarantees for any cost overruns. Um, so there, the economic calculation is quite different. Thank you, and there's a question. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Renata, and I'm sorry for ISTS, but I'm a FIFA master alumni. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, Mr. Back, when he was explaining um, about the agenda and he was talking a little bit about the situation today, he actually mentioned that they were sailing now in calm seas, if I'm not mistaken, that's how he said. And then on the answers that we got from the panel, we're painting a little bit of a dark scenario. So, my question is, considering the name of the, of the topic is uh, sport, the future of sports, is the future of sports really dark? And is there no future for the Olympic Games? And are we seeing exactly questions of esports and um, drones because there is no future for traditional sports? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. The, the focus is more on the future of the Olympic Games. So, or in link with that. <laughs> Thank you. OK, the future of the Olympic Games means also to talk about the future yeah. of sports, I think. Um, and there is not an easy answer, but I would say that looking at the structure of international sports federations um, in, in, the, in the each of the federations, um, plus the structures above that, which is you have the International Olympic Committee, but then there is also the Global Association of International Sports Federations, there is the grouping of Summer Olympic Federations, Winter Olympic Federations, IOC recognized federations, Association of Independent Members, Observers. Um, what we currently see is, first of all, a proliferation of multi-sport events. Mm -hmm. So we have the Olympic Games and we have the World Games, which used to be there, but there are now, since some time, Asian Beach Games, Asian Games, which we have European Games, we have European Championships. People are talking about the World Urban Games, World Combat Games, World Mind Games, um, sports festivals of all kinds, which are talked to, named World XYZ. So there's a proliferation of multi-sport events. Then there is competition going on from commercial operators. And there is a, a big danger that international federations might fail to uh, claim their place to be the governing body for sports. What we see in Europe is with court decisions that the international federations have no monopoly on saying this is the competition pyramid and that's what, what is valid and we can influence participation in these events. So there are commercial operators coming up making other events which they call world championships and technically we cannot do anything against it unless we have registered world XYZ championships for a lot of money. So there is tough competition going on, which where I would say, who knows what the landscape of international sports will look like in five years. It gets more and more complicated, more and more decentralized, and then there is this issue with the values of the Olympic Games. Um, it's not really calm seas. I see there is lots of issues going on. And what I'm missing as one representative of one international sports federation out of 120 plus, 50 plus observers and getting even more, that there is a coordination taking place and that there is a regular exchange of, of news and developments. And that's something that I'm lacking also from the International Olympic Committee. We are perceived as being part of the Olympic movement. We have to comply with all the rules and regulations. But in the end, there are the Olympic Games and then everything else we have to fight for our right to be there. And we also face challenges that um, our structure is questioned. Yeah? The classic model of a club and a national federation and international federations, guys, this doesn't work like that anymore. So we see that our national federations are struggling with what is our future, where do we get the next generation of, of pilots who want to fly, what do we do with the new sports and so on. So I would say, no, 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 no calm seas. Yeah? There's a lot of torrents in the water and there is a storm coming from left and right, like here on the Geneva Lake. And uh, we need to be very strong um, to maintain our place. Okay. It's a dark picture. I'm sorry for that. Yes, your turn. Thank you. 
Uh, hello, my name is Joanne. I'm a student at the University of Texas Austin studying international relations. <coughs> and my question is also about climate change. Um, so in regards to using pre-existing infrastructure to host future Olympic Games, are there going to be perhaps governing bodies or organizations that provide a set of guidelines that work towards making existing infrastructure more environmental friendly, or will these decisions be left to the entities within the host countries? Um, so the IOC in general tends to leave decisions to host countries and um, host cities. Um, and it depends largely on the host cities, really, what initiative they have shown in the past and will show in the future in terms of um, sustainability and in particular how they interpret the sustainability agenda. Um, and that can range from very local um, basic programs such, such as zero waste, recycle all the waste that, um, uh, that is produced at Olympic Games, to very ambitious ones such as um, carbon neutral games, such as um, tying the games into um, the sustainability transition, not only the urban sustainability transition, but a social sustainability transition. Uh, most of the programs bank on the hypothesis that the Olympic Games as a single big earthquake will be able to shake up society and transform society to produce lasting changes in our habits. And that is, uh, that's an assumption that um, is true for many things uh, around, around Olympic Games, saying, okay, the Olympic Games will inspire, it's the inspiration factor, will inspire people to make sports, will in inspire people to cycle to work and not take the car, will inspire people not to discriminate against people of other, other col uh, skin colors or race or whatever. Uh, the problem is that um, academic evidence for this inspiration effect is very thin to non-existent. So basically people, when they watch the Olympic Games, they don't want to be confronted with messages, change your lifestyle, do something different, think about the environment, eat veg vegetarian, don't take your car, but they want to be entertained. Um, and who can begrudge them that if we are constantly in our lives nowadays bombarded with messages like change your life from the day you, from the moment you get up in the morning, have you had enough sleep? Is your breakfast sustainable? Is it healthy? Do you drive to work or do you cycle? When you go to work, um, do, you, do, you, do you greet colleagues of, our, of other um, races or dif uh, differently? So you, you're constantly um, bombarded in our society with mes messages for change. And I think that's one of the problems of Olympic Games, that they are, in the end, a sports event that people watch to have fun and not to think about their lives and how to change their lives. And so that, that's the key problem with the inspiration factor. Yes, that's one of the goals, to demonstrate a showcase of how we could li live our lives differently. Um, but it's often the, me the message is, is often not set in the right context to actually produce behavior change. Patrick Klaas, professor, uh, professor at Sports Science Institute here in Lausanne. Uh, my, qu my question is for the floor, but perhaps for everybody also. It's about Castor Semenya case. So, Despina Mavromati, you are in the right place. But um, why uh, the level of testosterone is concerning only women? Because I'm sure the level of testosterone is very different from a man to another man. And so, why f only the question is for women? and not for everybody. Because I, I'm sure that, that men with a lot of testosterone could compete with uh, an advantage on other men. So why this focus on women? Thank you. Well, very briefly, my understanding from, uh, from the case is that both men and women have natural levels of testosterone that are produced endogenously, and there inherent differences between male and female athletes in terms of the natural testosterone levels. So uh, men, uh, male athletes are also systematically tested for exogenous testosterone and they're the uppest li limits, excuse me, they're uppest limits for male and female athletes. So what happens in this case is that uh, they're measuring specific conditions and even as I said uh, earlier today, the new regulations do not focus on hyperandrogenism but on the specific condition 
called uh, 46XY, so it's a chromosomic um, condition, um, and uh, the levels have to be lowered in order to fit within the female range of the APES limits. So it's, it's for both male and female, but this has been found to be the performance enhancing effect uh, uh, between male and female athletes, and that's why the IAAF found necessary uh, in this binary dis division uh, between male and female competitions, it found necessary to um, regulate also the upper limits of testosterone in female athletes. Well, I'm sure you can continue the discussion afterwards. Now, one last question. I'm afraid we have to close at one point because we have something going on right after. Uh, where, where, who has the microphone? It's you. Well, you already raised a question. You want to raise it again? Okay. Yeah. No if no problem. one has any question, yeah. Uh, well, I let you. I let you. Oh, you, we can have two, probably. Okay, okay. go ahead and then. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Um, but be so, brief, please. Yeah. Um, <laughs> from what I've heard, it seems to me I might sound a bit naive, but that Olympic Games nowadays are far more considered as um, an economic aspect. And if we look at for example, the three main poles of sustainability, which are um, social and env environmental and economic uh, poles, uh, it's only one third of um, the main preoccupation for sustainability issues. So um, shouldn't we focus a bit more on social um, impact from the Olympic Games? And for example, at Paris Olympic Games, uh, there is a collaboration with Yunus Sports Hub uh, from Mohamed Yunus, um, he won a Nobel Prize from uh, microcredit, micro um, if I remember correctly. And it's meant to enhance uh, social business from uh, local, um, local businesses and to, to foster uh, local economy. And so, it, yeah, I, I'd like to know your opinion on that social impact from Olympic, ga Olympic Games and the, this kind of legacy that is... Um, Provided by social legacy rather than yeah. a hard legacy. Who wants to, to answer this difficult? I can topic. say a couple of words, but I don't know if you too. Okay, um, um, I, I think that is a step in the right direction, and we've seen it also with the Vancouver Games, who tried to include um, First Nations Aboriginal people in um, purchasing. Um, I think my doubt would be that is it is a drop in the bucket. And it is a drop in the bucket, probably in a system that is still largely geared and controlled by corporate interests and big corporate sponsors, essentially. Um, so um, it, it, it's certainly good. I welcome it. Um, but it shouldn't stop there. Um, but, but it should lead to more, uh, generally more um, sustainable and profound transformation of how we conduct business um, ethically, um, also socially. Yeah, it was just to rebound on that, I think uh, you were talking about soft legacy. I think the social impact is, is soft, but it's almost everywhere. I think we shouldn't under underestimate the power of the games or any multi-sports event to that effect. I mean, having everyone under the same roof from different regions or, or countries, even countries at war. Uh, what uh, uh, Bach mentioned, uh, Pyeongchang. I mean, we had the team with South and North Korea competing together in ice hockey. I mean, this is pretty strong. Um, there's also some economic studies that show that there's a lot of the, the economic growth prior to and after the, Olymp the Olympic Games. I guess Rio was <laughs> a bit special. But uh, I think there's a lot of positive coming out of, of all of that. And so, uh, you know, when you look in Switzerland, the, the debate in the, in the journal where people say, well, why should we spend money to give to billionaires or organizations when we don't have pension plans? That's that's one side, but I think there's there's a lot of other positives, and we should yeah, not so forget. So we wouldn't uh, forget the soft legacies. People concentrate a lot on hard legacies, but the soft legacies are also very important. Okay, one last question from the director of the Institute of Sports Sciences at the University of Lausanne, Professor Kaiser. Thank you very much, Bengt Kaiser, director of the Institute of Sports Sciences, University of Lausanne. I'd like to invite you to look a bit further ahead. We've been toying with things on the horizon of a couple of years, maybe 10. What about 50? I'd like to challenge you to think about 50 years 
taking into account the acceleration of invention and what that means for the evolution of mankind. First, as a starter, sports and play have probably been around for a very long time. Modern sports has been around for a very short time. And it's been in a, in a kind of maelstrom of development. Today, two major society challenges uh, are confronting us. is what to do with the digitalization of everything and artificial intelligence. Some things already happening with regard to e-sports and hybrid sports, etc. What's going on there? And second, we're starting to toy with our genetic code. If it's true that there are already two kids in China that have been tinkered about, they're excluded from official sports according to the WADA rules. It's just the beginning. The Castor Semenya case is an eye-opener because she is natural, may I remind you, according to what the definition of natural is. She is forced to dope herself into a normality, which is, wow, what are we going to do with this? So please project yourself now in 50 years from now in a world populated in part by cyborgs. What will the athlete look like? Because may I recall you that sports only exist through the existence of athletes that compete. Okay, we'll to answer this one, maybe Stefano. <laughs> oh, there's no answer. Maybe this is just a conclusion. Uh, I, I, certainly, uh, oh, you want to say something? Uh, I think that probably we should uh, reconsider all the uh, definition of doping, of course. I think we should uh, reconsider also the use of, uh, uh, let's say, the... Uh, there will be all, all the uh, support, biometric support for, uh, for tracking performance if you detect some suspicious pattern. So there will be more control. So there will also the issue which is still uh, today on the table about the rights of the athletes uh, and protection of athletes from the, the excessive control on, on, their, on their life. So there, there will be issue related to their uh, human rights that is still now, but it will be, uh, I think, uh, uh, bigger and bigger, and uh, yes, I think that the big challenge is, it will be about the definition of, of what is uh, a clean sport or not. I, I totally agree with you, but I can't project in 50 years. Uh, it's well, it's, as, it's as, tough. As, in as thing, someone else said, in, in 50 seconds. years' time, uh, many of us will not be around. <laughs> <laughs> well, certainly me. <laughs> Yeah, but the interesting thing is about uh, sports that somehow people um, develop rules for a game and um, then there is this idea that uh, these rules should be the same around the world uh, so that you can meet uh, from different parts of the world and can play a game and you play it according to the same rules and you want to find out who is the best. So, so this the question will always is if, remain in a way. The question is if that will, if that will actually remain. I mean, yeah. it's also well. not a very long existing concept if, if, if you look at it. Sure, um, sure. But I, I mean, I'm, I'm currently reading a book which is called The Rise of the Machines, which is about uh, s cybernetics coming Robots. up and how it went until uh, recent times. And you read 1970s, 80s, 1990s, there was a big hype about virtual reality and going into the internet and having a second life and so on. And yeah. look what has come out of it. It somehow disappeared and now it's coming up again. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm still thinking there will be the wish of every one of us to be socializing with human beings and meeting and exchanging stories and comparing your ways of performance. And that's my belief that also in 50 years' time, that will still exist. OK. Well, it's difficult to summarize uh, such a large debate. But uh, I remember for the next uh, maybe 20, 30 years, or 50 years, why not, uh, there will be some keywords like uh, sustainability, esports, anti-doping. And a few of us, you want to add another, another one, maybe, Despina? I would say that sport will change, and the definition of sport would unavoidably cha change. Mm -hmm. But uh, Thomas Bach was talking about the Olympic values, but uh, he, he didn't mention that behind the Olympic values, there is a multi-billion industry that supports these Olympic values. The Olympic values on their own would mean little 
behind the support. So we shouldn't be so snobby about esports, which is only an industry, because this thing will definitely evolve into something bigger, mm -hmm. and sport will have to adapt to uh, these yeah, Certainly, sport has evolved a lot from the 19th century or 18th century when uh, modern sports started, and uh, it will continue to evolve. I'm saying this exactly that to my students. So maybe this is a good conclusion, and it's time to thank you very much. Thank the panelists. Don't, don't leave the room, please. We have one more thing.